Hello everyone and welcome to this very special edition of the CX Green Room where we are celebrating CX Day. So happy CX Day everyone. Uh, my name is Claire Beatty. I'm Senior Director for Customer Advocacy here at Genesis, uh, joined by my colleague and co-host Ginger Conlon, who's Thought Leadership Director. Nodding and smiling. And David Hello, Allen. <laughs> And uh, David Allison, who's founder of the Valley Graphics Project and our very special guest for today. Um, so before we get going and start having a, a discussion, I like to make this joke every year and I'm not going to cheat you out of my favourite joke. That is uh, Ginger Conlon is not only one of my esteemed colleagues, she is also the mother of CX Day. <laughs> and with that, I'm going to hand it over to Ginger, Ginger to explain why. Okay, all right. Well, it's slight exaggeration on the mothering part, but involved, I was uh, on the founding board of Customer Experience Professionals Association back when they launched CX Day and was heavily involved in getting the word out, um, overseeing lots of blogs and other kind of content uh, to production to make sure that we got the word out as far and wide as we could, because we are celebrating those frontline agents who are the face of our brands, who work so hard to make sure that people are having the best customer experience that they could have. And it's not an easy job. We have some very demanding customers. So uh, they do an amazing job. And this is just a day where we celebrate everyone in the customer, the customer service, customer experience industry. So for everyone out there, happy CX day. So with that, uh, David, thank you very much for joining us um, as our special guest today. Um, you have been uh, on, on quite a journey with Genesis. We've worked together for the last couple of years. I'm really happy to have you back. What we're going to be talking about today is really how organizations can build the best possible environment for their people to keep their people happy and engaged and um, and empathize with them as they're um, working with customers on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so David, before we dive in, just tell us a little bit about yourself and about the Valley Graphics Project. I would love to do that, but first thing we have to do is establish that Ginger now has a new official nickname. She's Mama CX. Okay, we're all, that's that's for the rest of our time together today, at least. She's Mama CX. I love that. Okay, so Mama She's CX. She's really going to thank you. She's going to thank you for that. <laughs> Mama CX and Claire. Uh, so the question, um, a little bit about myself and about value graphics. Well, um, you know, I come from a long, long, deep history in marketing, which is really all just about how do you get people engaged and motivated to do things? And through a series of... Uh, weird turns and twists like we all have with our careers, uh, I've ended up in this place where I've taken that skill set and transferred it in a much broader way to how do we get anybody to do anything? How do we get people to be excited about things, including the workforce inside the customer, uh, in, inside the contact centers and inside the CX industry? Uh, and so that's what value graphics are. Value graphics is a thing we've invented that um, based on an enormous amount of data, that stands there beside demographics and psychographics as another way to look at people that profiles groups based on what's inside their heart instead of the stuff we can see on the outside, demographics, or past behaviors, psychographics. So you have all three, you got a pretty great way of thinking about people, you know, who they are on the outside, how they behave so far. And with value graphics, now we understand who they are on the inside and what they really care about and what drives them in their life. Well, we have worked with, with you, David, for um, several years now. And one of the big initiatives that we did was a study of 16,000 um, contact center agents, where we looked at what differentiates people who work in customer experience by their values compared to um, the general population. Um, that was a really fascinating project for us, David. Tell us, um, you know, what, what kind of interested you or surprised you about that project? 
Well, I mean, anytime we get to look at a global audience and compare region by region, a similar set of people and see how different they are and how similar they are. One of the things that always strikes me whenever we do this, regardless of whether we're looking at internal workforces or customer groups or whoever, is just how similar we really are all around the world. And I think that's a point that's worth celebrating uh, on a celebratory day like today, like CX Day, is that, uh, you know, this this moment in time, I think there's a lot of forces in the world that would like to divide us and convince us that we're very different from each other, when in fact, we're, we're not all that different from each other. Uh, there's only 56 core values that drive humans to do everything they do all day long, 24-7, 365. And yeah, in different parts of the world, they show up in slightly different ways, but it's only 56 things that make us different from each other. It's not that many. You know, when you think about there's 88 keys on a piano keyboard, it's harder to understand how to play happy birthday or, uh, you know, chopsticks on the piano than it is to understand who everybody in the world is and what we care about and how we live our lives. So I, I think that came through loud and clear. There were similarities around the world. That, that connect all people who work in contact centers. There were some differences region to region, but but there were some really big findings that I think came across um, across the board. Great, well, we'll look forward to digging into that with you. So before we dig into that, this is the CX Green Room where we bring the heavy hitters. And we know that you know the heavy hitters have strong opinions about what they need in the green room to make it a smooth, presentation or, you know, interaction once they, they get out there in front of the audience, right? So now David did have an original CX Green Room item that he switched up at the last minute. So let's take a quick moment to tell us about what item that you had to have today. In the, in well, the you know, in honor of uh, uh, Mama CX, uh, we have, um, I even brought, I brought it right here. So I've got my little thing of ginger snaps ginger get it uh and some ginger tea because ginger so we got ginger snaps and ginger tea to have a chat with ginger and my friend claire claire there's no cookies named after you or i would have had some of those here too i won't take it personally don't worry <laughs> well we love that the original was oatmeal cookies which what what we were prepared for but uh the, i like the i like the switch up that was pretty fun <laughs> So uh, let's dive into the first or the second question. Um, as Claire said, we worked on a report together where we uncovered CX employees' uh, values globally. And more than 16,000 agents were part of the study. Nearly half of them say that they would like more support from their managers. And about the same amount say that what they love most about their job are opportunities for advancement and learning new skills and new technologies. In other, in other words, they want more empathy and they want kind of a personalized experience like a customer would, would want. Now, at the same time, we released a report with MIT Technology Review Insights on customer experience and the future of work. And in that, we found that employee engagement is pretty low. CX leaders surveyed said that low morale among their staff is one of the top challenges that they're facing right now. So if you think about that environment and these two sides of the coin, why are values so important right now? Well, you know, I have a big giant opinion on this um, based on, on data, but uh, for the last couple of decades, and, and maybe even longer than that, organizations around the world of all kinds, in, in an effort to reduce risk, we've been drunk on data, just like can't get enough of it. Somebody sent out a note and said, data is the new oil and just grab as much of it as you possibly can. And so boardroom decision making has become this exercise that's entirely based on what the data says we should do. If it doesn't have data to back it up, we are not going to make a decision about anything because data is sort of, in, in effect, the love language of corporations. And that's cool. But you know what? The one thing that we can't make, we haven't been able to put on a spreadsheet to bring into our organizations is humans. 
because humans are irrational and emotional and logical and messy, and we don't behave the way we're supposed to. If you talk to a rational economist and say, okay, what's going to happen if we raise prices? They're going to say, well, we're going to drop demand. And then some company goes and raises prices and demand goes through the roof. And we don't behave in the ways the data says. So companies have been saying, let's get this human stuff that doesn't fit in the spreadsheets. Let's get it out of here. We got to make it go away. But the problem with that data omnipotence is that we've been, yeah, we've been, we've been ignoring everything that has to do with being human. And so consequently, I think our shared, our shared humanity, if you want, uh, it's been all but removed from the decision making. So what's the answer? We got to bring it back in. People are feeling disconnected from work. They're feeling disconnected from their careers, from their, for some people, their calling. Uh, because there's no humanity left inside our organizations. Now, if we're going to make this work, organizations have to be able to still speak in data. They're not going to change their language for us. Corporations aren't going to suddenly start going, oh, we don't need any data anymore. We're, we're over that now. So the fact that we've managed to take values and turn it into data means that now we have a language that we can use inside our boardrooms to give humanity a seat at the boardroom table. We can bring our essential, messy, illogical, irrational humanness back into the boardrooms now because we can speak the code that everybody in the boardroom wants to speak. So I think all of the findings that we see about workforces and, and, and employees and talent around the world and about how they're not feeling like this is really, you know, jiving for them sometimes. Uh, a lot of that can be traced back to the fact that the organizations are set up to look at data and technology and things that go in a spreadsheet and humans don't go on a spreadsheet. So we can fix that now. We can bring these th two things together. In the, in the report that we worked on together, this large survey of 16,000 agents, the, the value that kind of came to the top as the, the, the strongest shared value amongst agents was a concept of personal responsibility and I remember at the time you said that it was unusual to see that value so strongly felt in the population. Tell us a bit about that specific value, why it's so, what it is, why it's so important and why you don't often see it. Yeah, well, why we don't often see it, I don't know. That's just about humans. You know, some humans have it and some people don't. So what's the reason? Well, it's, I mean, now, now we're getting into ch early childhood development and all these kinds of things that have nothing to do with what we're here to talk about today. But the fact is it shows up in different ways in different parts of the world and different populations of the world. Give you a couple of quick examples around the world. If we look at the entire population of the planet, personal responsibilities in a roughly the 40th percentile uh, in terms of how important it is to people on the entire planet Earth. And then if we go to, let's just say, the United States, uh, it's around the 50th percentile, just peaks up over 50. I think it's like 52 or 53 percent. But if we look at people who work in contact centers around the world, it's in this, and depending on the region of the world we're looking at, it's in the 60th, 70th, 80th percentile. It's far more important to people who've ended up in this career than it is to the rest of us who have not ended up in this particular line of work. Now, why? Something about working in a contact center is uh, aligned with that value of personal responsibility because humans only do anything if it's aligned with their values. So some set of values has brought these folks to be in the, in, the, in the contact center industry, working on those front lines, and personal responsibility is one part of why they are there. So as a contact center owner or manager, as a leader, you need to take advantage of this and give them as much of that personal responsibility as they crave as, as, as you possibly can. You gotta find all kinds of ways to, you know, if you think about the uh, customer journey, you think instead about an employee journey, what are all the touch points that you can um, infuse with this value of personal responsibility? Some, some, some ideas around that. Um, uh, first one is uh, let them be personally responsible for some stuff. Uh, individually or as small groups and small teams, um, what are some of the tasks and, and uh, things that need to be done inside the organization that you can carve off and say, okay, you guys are responsible for that. Give them a degree of autonomy to go and solve that, some resources to use and hold them accountable for what happens at the back end. But don't lean over them and, and watch what they're doing. Like let them go and do stuff. They're going to thrive in that and, and feel 
that you're honoring their values by letting them go and be personally responsible for something. And then of course, yes. sorry, go ahead. I'm just rattling um, on give here. Us, give, us a, give us a short definition of what personal responsibility means. Ah, yeah. So personal responsibility, people who respond well to, or, or have personal respond, responsibility as one of their values, they just want to be the person who gets stuff done. They, they're, they want to be the one who moves the needle. They want to be the one who uh, uh, does. They're not, they're not people who sit on the sofa and say, you know what somebody should do about that thing. They're going to get up off the sofa and go do that thing and be the ones who lead the charge around making change happen and make things happen. And if you stifle that, they're going to feel out of alignment with their values. And that's not a good place for any workforce to be. And if you reward that and, and, and nurture that and foster that, you're going to have a a, 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 a huge team of people who are just anxious to help and move things forward and feel like they're taking responsibility for stuff. Now, I've never worked in a contact center, but um, I, I, there's got to be amazing ways that you can put individuals um, into roles where they're responsible personally for getting stuff done. And so any way that you can do that is going to be very well received. For me, when I when I hear you talking, I think about the way that the contact center is incentivized, with with you know contact center employees being very self motivated, self starting, keen to achieve. Um, perhaps it lends itself to rethinking the way that we measure staff to um, to be more to be more owning their KPIs. How I, I help me understand? I, give me a little more depth around that. Well, so for example, if we're measuring people on metrics such as um, handle time and 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 things that are very very prescriptive, also re with regards to scheduling, giving people very tightly controlled schedules, I think there's an opportunity there for giving people more ownership over their the way that they work and the way that they achieve their numbers. Yeah, for sure. Um, I, I love that notion of making people more personally responsible for their KPIs. Um, you know, maybe this is silly, but sometimes silly things make a big impact. Maybe instead of them being key performance indicators, they're key personal indicators. Just rename them uh, and make people feel a sense of ownership around them. Uh, and then if you're going to do that, a way to kind of, my word of the week, inculcate uh, this sense of personal responsibility inside the organization is, is to reward it when you see it. So when somebody's key personal indicators are off the charts, there needs to be some kind of uh, recognition of that. It doesn't have to be big and fancy. People have this idea, leadership has this idea that recognition needs to be like, there's an award show and there's like a banquet and there's no, it's handing somebody a chocolate bar and saying, you win this week, you win the chocolate bar of the week award. It's just seeing, letting them see that you see them and that it's around their values and that their values are being honored and respected and and uh, that they're allowed to thrive around those things that are key parts of who they are on the inside. I have another one. So do I. Okay. okay. <laughs> you go, you go. Um, so <laughs> a question I have for you, um, David, we've talked about uh, how people's values don't change right. and you know, their values are who they are. But at the same time, a lot of organizations are thinking about how they create jobs for Generation Z, you know, which will soon become the biggest cohort in the workplace. Perhaps it already is in some markets. But how do you reconcile these two ideas, which are, you know, the values don't change, but also, you know, there's a next generation that perhaps feels differently about things? Yeah. So here's one of the most beautiful things we found after I give you a little little context. So anybody who hasn't been following value graphics and doesn't understand what we do, you know, we've 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 talked to close to a million people around the world now. The long these long form surveys and they're qual quant surveys. So there's lots of long form answers which we've coded and turned turned into data. So we've now got close to a million survey responses in this database. Uh, it's a plus or minus 3.5% accuracy, 95% confidence, which makes it more accurate than you need for a PhD from Harvard. The data has been collected in uh, uh, across 180 countries in 152 different languages. So this is the most complete and accurate um, record of what everybody cares about across all ages, genders, marital status, all the demographics uh, that's ever been compiled. 
So we can look at these things and say, well, how different are people who are from Gen Z than the people who are boomers or from some other segment of the population? And the answer is when it comes to comparing values, they're not that different at all. Within our margin of error of 3.5%, there might be a point or two outside of that. But basically values don't change, not only once you as an individual have your values, they're set with you for life and they're not gonna change until, no, they're not gonna change, you're great. Those are the values you're stuck with for the rest of your life. But also from one generation to the next, the rate of change of which values are the most important and least important and which values show up, it's nominal. It's like, it's, it's not worth paying attention to. So the values of the people in the workforce today who are Gen Z versus the values who are boomers, they're the same. Now, how we act out on those values, that's what's different. So you could be, mm, let's say somebody, well, personal responsibility. What personal responsibility means to someone who's a boomer near the end of their career versus what personal responsibility means to somebody who's a Gen Z at the beginning of their career, how they want that to show up for them in the workplace is could be different, could be the same. Uh, so there's some oh, there's some room for some variance there, but the values they, they're not they they are age agnostic. Values are age agnostic, and in fact, demographic agnostic. Values don't care if you're a man or a woman, or if you're rich or poor, or black or white, or gay or straight, or young or old. Values don't care. Values are just uh, values are just there, and there, it's a reflection of the society that we live in. Speaking of a reflection of society, right now everyone's talking about AI, and so we need to ask the AI question. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, you know, companies are using AI to support their um, frontline employees. For example, they're using real-time knowledge and coaching, next best action recommendations. But how do you see values like, what are you seeing in the market? How do you see values kind of playing a role as we evolve AI into the employee experience? Yeah, I think it's kind of a tangential to the answer to the first question that you asked, which is that we need to bring, okay, in an age of super technologies like AI, who knows what's around the corner? Some other thing is going to come along. It's, it's going to be equally as earth shattering. In the age of super technologies, our only antidote is to be superhuman because that's where we're going to win. You know, the things that boardrooms tend to not like about humans that were irrational, emotional, ir illogical, and nonsensical sometimes, uh, those are things that the computers are trained to not be. Don't go doing any of that stuff. That's bad stuff. So we need to double down on what makes us human. Uh, you know, a great example. Um, you all know the story about 3M sticky notes. That was a mistake. They were out to try and figure out some way of making glue for something. And this is a glue that failed. It only held like just a little bit. And AI or a technology would have looked at and gone fail, and thrown, it away, thrown it out. A human looked at it and went, that's not what I was looking for, but wow, that would be a really cool thing to do this with. And poof, how many billions of dollars later, the 3M corporation with their sticky notes. So if we can lean into the stuff that makes us unique and let the technology be the best technology, stop trying to compete with the technology, let the technology do that stuff. And it doesn't go to, it's not, it's trained to not want to compete with us when be a emotional, nonsensical, <laughs> mistake-making uh, 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 entity. I think, but between the two of us, if we had superhumans and supercomputers, we're going to do super stuff. And I think that's the best way to think about this and, and go forward. Yeah, I think that's my answer. I think that's the best way for us to think about it. And then I want to go back to one thing on the human side. Um, going back to the report, one of the findings. So in our state of customer experience report, we found that the majority of customers want um an empathetic experience over a speedy resolution. They want to feel heard and understood. Yes, they want their issue resolved, but they really, uh, in that process, they want to feel heard and understood. Yet in the values report, when you look at, we asked these 16,000 agents around the, the globe, what do they see as their greatest strength? Uh, empathy was only 9% said that that was their greatest strength. About half said thoroughness and complete, completeness, 
not surprising with you know personal responsibility being the top value. Similarly, um, just a little bit more than a third consider their greatest strength to be empathy. I mean, uh, sorry, efficiency, speed, and adherence. Again, not surprising in an environment where you're paid to get things done and get things done quickly. So any advice for CX leaders here? Because as AI takes on more rote tasks and agents need to be more, you know, have a higher EQ, how can, how can managers use values to help them have more empathy and interactions? Well, first off, we have to look at what you found as a, as a, that, that, those stats that you just quoted as a reflection of what's going on at the moment. You, know, you ask your employees, which of these things are you good at? Being fast and efficient or being empathetic? And the employees are going, what does he want me to say? I'm fast and efficient. That's the answer because you've been taught that. It's sort of what's present in the environment and you're rewarded for that. So of course you're gonna say those things. So I think your empathy score might be a little low because people were maybe scared to say, that's the thing I'm really, really good at because it's not what they thought the boss wanted to hear in the study that they were doing. Um, but that being said, the best way to increase that empathy muscle uh, is to show people that that's not a bad thing. And so how do you do that? I think it's about building a workplace culture that's a reflection of people's values. If, if there's anything more empathetic, I don't know what it is, than to say, listen, we're going to make this place work for you. We're going to make this place feel like it's aligned with your values. We're going to find ways to make this place feel like a place you want to be and you can't wait to come to every day. That's showing empathy to your workforce. And they're in turn going to say, well, gee, okay, empathy, we may not call it, may not use that word for it, but caring about us, caring about people is the way this company comes to town. The ways of the way this company likes to dance the dance. So now I should be able to see the direct correlation between that and the way I treat my customers. I want to treat them the way I'm being treated. So I, I think the biggest step forward towards creating a more empathetic workforce is to show them that it's okay to be empathetic and to do that in a very, very personal way. Um, yeah, you know, it's, it's time for a very large shift in this conversation about, not this conversation today, but in the conversation about how we set up the workplace and, and what is important. And it feels awkward for senior leadership sometimes because what's safe and comforting is to see KPIs that are about things like um, efficiency and performance and number of things closed and number of conversations resolved and all those kinds of things. But what I think it would be a great message and a great takeaway today on CX Day, particularly with Mama CX here on the call, uh, is that um, the softer parts of this conversation are actually more powerful than the trackable parts. The more you're able to give people that culture where they feel that their values are honored and respected, the more loyal they'll be, the more empowered they'll feel, the more um, willing to go the extra mile for that really difficult customer that they're talking to today. Uh, because they feel that that's just how we are. That's who we are. This is how we face the world. Uh, it may not be at this moment in time something that's as easily tracked as how many calls did you get through in the last hour? Um, but it's something that will, over the medium and long term, pay back significantly higher dividends. And I can say that from a place of data, because we know that values are as much as eight times more powerful when it comes to understanding and, and predicting and, and, and influencing and motivating people. It's eight times, and we can go into a long thing about the math behind that, but it's an eight times better way to understand each other and understand people and to think about the things that we'd like people to do. Use values to understand and motivate and inspire instead of demographics and psychographics and all that other boring stuff. Think about people based on what's in their heart. Yeah, I'll stop there. 
David, thank you so much for sharing your uh, perspective with us today. Uh, very much aligned with Genesis and our mission to empower employees to deliver superhuman service through technology. So uh, very much appreciate you joining us. Everyone who joined us in the audience, thank you very much. Please do like and share uh, this, uh, this live stream and wishing you all a very happy CX day. Thank you.